perfecting holiness in the fear of God. They pursue a heavenly life in gospel obedience to all the commands that Christ as head and king has given them in his word. So again, picking up on the uh, war imagery and the battle imagery that the Bible often uses in terms of our sanctification, this last section uh, talks in the same manner, that this is a war between the new reality and the old reality, between the new you that is being raised up and the old you that is slowly but surely coming to an end. And so again, it's important that we think clearly through this. From the standpoint of heaven, you are completely, absolutely, perfectly, 100% sinless and righteous at the moment of your justification. Okay? Justification is not a process. Justification does not take time. Justification happens in a moment in time at your conversion. And when that happens... Heaven says you are perfect. There is no sin that God counts against you. So that's kind of on the upper plane, so to speak. On the lower plane, on earth, here, it is a process of catching up to what heaven has said. Okay, That God's will may be done on earth as it has already been done in heaven. That is sanctification. That's the war that this is talking about, growing in greater and greater conformity to what heaven has already said is objectively true. And on the first clause here, the uh, passage for footnote 10 is Romans 7.23. And do we have someone who is willing to read Romans 7.23? Keith. Okay, so there's wartime imagery again, right? There's a, Paul says exactly that this is uh, another law waging war, okay? So sin is attempting to hold us captive. The law of God has liberated us, and so now we have this overlapping age in our life between justification and glorification where we are being sanctified, and that is a slow and sometimes frustratingly slow process of that holiness actually rolling out. It goes on after footnote 10 here. It says, Yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part overcomes. And that's the good news. Okay, That's the good news. Uh, the trajectory of the Christian life is not flat. Okay, The trajectory of the Christian life is upward. Now, does that mean it's, it's upward like a rocket? Like every second you're higher than the last second? No, it's not like that. It's more like climbing a mountain. Okay? All of a sudden you, you get to a dead end and then you've got to stop and kind of work around and, and get back up again. Okay? The trajectory is always up, though. Momentary dips, but there is an actual trajectory to the Christian life and it's not flat. And it's not downward either. It's upward. The, the trajectory of the Christian life is upward, okay? So I may struggle in a way this month that I did not last month. So on a short-term scale, it may look like things are going backwards. But at age 40, I would like to think I'm significantly more sanctified than I was at age 20. And I trust that at age 60, it will be significantly better, okay? It's upward, not every day upward, but over a lifetime, it is most certainly upward. Because, it says here, the regenerate part overcomes. And again, we'll go to Romans there. Who wants to read Romans 6, 14? Do we have someone? Sonia. Okay, very good. Sin will have no dominion over you. Okay, and this is again such an important concept. 
we sometimes talk in theology about reigning sin and remaining sin. Okay? Reigning sin means you are a slave to sin. It, sin is king of your life. Okay? You are ruled by sin. And this is every unregenerate person. Every unbelieving person is ruled by sin. They are under the dominion of sin. They are under the law of sin. They are incapable entirely of pleasing God. They can make no motion, no cooperation uh, to God's favor whatsoever on their own steam. They are under the dominion of sin. They are absolutely ruled by it. And even when they do externally good things, they're serving themselves. It's self-serving. Okay? It, it does not move the needle of God's approval in any way, shape, or form. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. They cannot move the needle. That is the dominion of sin. Sin rules. That's reigning sin. And as Christians, we are no longer under the dominion of sin. Sin no longer reigns. Sin does, however, remain. You see the distinction? Okay? And this actually ties in to the Pentecost sermon very well this morning. Who remembers... If you're my age or older, who remembers Boris Yeltsin on the run from the Soviet Union military? Okay. Who remembers Saddam Hussein cruising around in caves out in the desert after he lost control of Iraq? Okay. Who remembers Osama bin Laden after he lost control and he's living in caves? Okay. Those men no longer reign. They do, however, remain. Okay. Saddam Hussein lost control of Iraq. He is deposed. He no longer has dominion. Does that mean he's dead? No. There was a period of time when he's on the run, hiding in caves, from when his dominion ended to when his death happened. That is sin in the life of the Christian. It has been dethroned. It has been conquered. It no longer has dominion. It is waging its little attacks, but it's as a defeated opponent. Okay? The regenerate part overcomes. So there is no longer reigning sin in the life of the Christian, but that does not mean there is not remaining sin. Okay? But thinking of it in biblical categories really helps fuel our sanctification because you're no longer going up against the armed forces of Iraq. You're up against some guy with 20 other guys that have some guns around him. And yeah, it's, take it seriously. Okay? But you're no longer up against a monarch. You're no longer up against a ruler. You're up against someone who's been defeated. Okay? Doesn't mean he doesn't exist. It doesn't mean he's not real. It just means he's been deposed. Remaining sin, not reigning sin. Okay? I'm going to stop there and ask, because we've spent considerable time using this kind of imagery, um, and I don't regret that, because I think this is a, a, a conception that we really need to get into our minds if we think carefully and biblically about justification and sanctification and how it is we put remaining sin to death in our lives. It's not a frantic battle. And, and so I'm just going to stop there and, and ask for a bit of feedback. How, is this imagery working? Do we need to switch word pictures? Do, is it starting to come together, the nature of the battle we're in with sin? Okay, that's a good way to frame it. Yep, good. Okay, anyone else? Marina. Oh, there's a great word picture. That's Corey Ten Boom. Okay, so Marina just said Corey Ten Boom talks about a bell keeps ringing after the cord has been been severed, right? Yep, that great picture. That's great. There was a hand over here somewhere. I just wanted to repeat that one more. Okay. Okay. Good. Read. No? Okay. I saw it. I see that hand. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Is, this, is the concept, is the framework for understanding this starting to, or maybe not starting to, but is it really, is that cement getting hard in terms of understanding how this works? Okay. Okay. 
Good. Yeah, it works. The, the war imagery works for me very, very well because that's how real life works. Yeah. Charlie. Well, I think it works the same way. So if, if your enemy has been deposed, the nature of the fight completely changes. Okay, because you can rest in that this work, the decisive work, has already happened. We're going out and announcing and walking in the truthfulness of that reality. So we are not fighting to conquer Satan. He's already conquered we are not fighting to be justified. We're resting in Christ that that work has been finished. The Christian life is not fighting for victory. It's uh, getting in line with the announcement that the victory has already been transacted. It's done. So, so there's a resting even when we see uh, that we have something to do. And in fact, in oh, now I have to think where it is. It's in Romans 5, I think. And I'm not probably going to find it right now. But anyway, well, another one that I can think of offhand is Philippians 2, 12, and 13. Uh, that we ought to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to work and to will for his good pleasure. There's, you see two things there. One, you have something to do. Okay, we have something to do. No one else will fight sin for you. No one else will have faith in Christ for you. Okay? You have to do that. And why do you do it? Well, because it's already been given to you. Okay? It's, it's already g- given to you. So you can rest in it, but, but uh, you know, when God says to Joshua, uh, just st- stand still and watch the victory of the Lord, well, eventually the troops have to move. But the victory is the Lord's. But eventually you've got to move in. <laughs> Right? So we don't, we don't become passive. Resting doesn't mean we're passive. Resting means we're uh, following orders and trusting that the, the decisive part of this has already happened. But, but we, we don't want to become passive in the Christian life. We just want to act in conformity with what God uh, has says is true already. Anything else on this? Yeah, and I think if we look at, so that's a good example, but even just the overall, basically in all of the pastoral letters, and all of Paul's epistles, what you almost always have is several chapters of systematic theology and then application. Paul never jumps into, here, do this, try harder, uh, here's four tricks, <laughs> you know, to overcome lying in your life, here's the five smooth stones of overcoming anger. It, he never does that. It's truth, truth, truth. System. You, you get 12 chapters of theology in Romans, and then you get a few chapters of application at the end. Because this is true, now therefore, this. But it's always based on Christ. The Bible never just gives you a command to do something without providing it for you first. Never. It, it's always given to you first, now do this. So we're always working out of fullness. God works it in, we work it out. Anything else? Is this a different way of thinking about, I mean, we've been on it for a couple weeks now, but is this a different way of thinking about sanctification than we might have assumed earlier in our Christian life, or than we might have assumed growing up? Is this a different type of approach? Or is this consistent with, with probably the way we've thought about it generally? Thank you. 
I think so, maybe. So you're saying even Christians sometimes struggle with unbelief. Right. So Audrey's bringing up what is the place of unbelief in the Christian life? Kind of in terms of how does that explain our sin? Right? Or our struggle with sin? And I think it can be different things, but one of the most honest explanations of human experience to the Bible to me always seems like, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Right? Can't we all resonate with that? I believe. Please help me believe. Right? Um, That's a very honest statement. And I think, really, if we think about the moment of temptation, when we're struggling about whether we're going to lose our cool or not, when you're struggling about whether you're going to remain sexually pure or not, when you think about, you know, whatever the temptation that presents itself is, I would actually say Christian or non-Christian, every act of sin, every time we give into sin is a form of unbelief. Because we're believing a lie rather than the truth. Right? We don't sin unless we are convinced in that moment that the sin will bring me more happiness than righteousness will bring me. Well, that is unbelief. That's how sin started. God says, don't do this. Our first parents say, well, no, we're smarter than that. Like, what do you know, God? Times have changed. I mean... This creation's already seven days old, and times have changed, and, and that was then, and this is now, and, and after all, I mean, this food looks good for eating. It is unbelief, right? And, and every time we give in to sin, we are saying with our actions that I believe sin is more rewarding than righteousness is. And so I do believe Christians can struggle with unbelief, and that is exactly this, this piece that we need to put to death. Who do you trust? Do you, who do you trust? What will bring us joy? Lisa. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I always encourage people to say, you know, if God is sovereign, then blah, blah, blah. No, no, don't. How about you say, since God <laughs> If leaves it open as a question, right? If God is so forgiving, no, no, stop right there. It's a bad way to frame it. Since God is so forgiving, then finish the thought. Since, not if. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, but, but that's, it doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means we're so used to doing things, we do things instinctively without thinking about them. But if you'd stop and process, okay, why? Why does this pathway seem so natural to me? Right? But I, I do believe probably 95% of our behavior is completely unexamined. We just don't think about the choices we're making. You're going to have some clarity if you stop and think about it, but we typically don't stop and think about it. We do things that feel natural to us, and we all do that, and it can be in harmless things. Um, you know, before we changed the seating arrangement, we all sat in the same chairs. Well, that's not right or wrong, but it's just, why, why does one person prefer an aisle seat and one person prefers a window seat? We don't think about that, but there's something in us that prefers that we... All of our choices are doing what we want. No one ever chooses anything that they don't want, right? Um, so there is, but those desires and those, those internal decision-making techniques are so native to us, I, I really don't think we ever stop and think about it. And I think the, the sobriety of the Holy Spirit would say, well, no, no, stop for a minute. Think about this. Will being an idiot with your friends uh, you know, drinking too much, is that really, like, really? That's the, that's the path to satisfaction, really? And if you just stop and think about it for eight seconds, it's like, well, no, that's dumb. Why would I do that, right? 
But the reason you do it is because you're not stopping yourself to even think about it. It's just, oh, right, I'll, I'll be an idiot like everyone else. Well, you're believing a lie without even processing the lie that you're believing. Right? But, but I am a big believer in almost all human behavior is unexamined. It doesn't mean there's not something happening. It just means we, we very rarely stop to evaluate why. Why does this feel so natural to me? And for me, a, a big pathway that I've worn out so that that pathway is so deep that I just want to keep going into it and I've had to work tremendously hard against is anxiety. That pathway just is so well worn, I just, you know, just always want to... <laughs> right? It's like a wake behind a boat. I just always want to end up there. And it, to stop that... And I think any of our mental games that we play with ourselves or, or those things, it takes intentional effort to stay out of that rut that is so well-traveled that we, we become friends with it. There was another hand up here. Amen. Yep. Yeah, so Rob was just mentioning, as the Holy Spirit is formed in us, one of the fruits is we will start examining our behavior and start thinking about it, right? One of the speakers at yesterday's conference shared a Matthew Henry quote, and it was, of course, worded like a Puritan, so it was very well alliterated, and I'll butcher it now. But something to the effect of, the man who thinks best of himself thinks not of himself the best. And in other words, if you think you're crushing it, you probably have the least valid opinion of yourself of anyone else. Right? Ask 10 wise people around you if you're crushing it, and they're probably going to find a polite way of letting you know that you're probably not crushing it. Okay? Um, but typically, the, the higher we think of ourselves, the, the looser our grasp on, re, grasp on reality tends to be. Right? It, we, need, we need eyes to see, right? and, and that is part of the Holy Spirit's work, is to convict us of sin, to help us see things. And because He's kind and patient, Typically, that doesn't all happen at once. Could you imagine if you saw all your sin all at once? Could you imagine how discouraging that would be? Right? But, but the fact is, he sends people into our lives, or he sends uh, providentially timed thoughts or experiences or whatever that help us to see, man, this behavior that seems so natural, maybe I grew up that way, maybe that was the atmosphere at home, maybe that was this or that, or maybe the, I learned this at school from my friends, whatever it is, and you all of a sudden say, I am such an idiot, right? And for me, it, it often takes form in the place, if everyone around me is an idiot, guess who the idiot is, <laughs> right? If everyone around you is getting it wrong and is an insufferable jerk, a hundred percent chance I'm the insufferable jerk, Right? But we need eyes to see that, and that comes from the Holy Spirit, and that comes sometimes from difficult conversations. We just went through Matthew 18. We, we have to be able to help each other see the back of our head sometimes and see, hey, we just stop there. Maybe, you know, have you, have you considered this? Um, but that is the work of the Holy Spirit, absolutely, is to, to grow in that conviction. Anything else here? On Romans 6.14 or related. Yeah, go ahead and then over here. Correct. Nothing.
Yes. Yeah. Sanctification is, involves us very much. There's, um, so we talked a few weeks back about the order of salvation. You do absolutely zero to contribute to your regeneration. The rebirth is not as a result of a decision you make. The decision you make to follow Christ is a result of the, re- the rebirth. God just does it. He does not get your cooperation. He does not ask your permission. Okay? He just does it. You're reborn 100% God, 0% you. Okay? Man contributes absolutely zero to his rebirth and to his justification. But now, after those things, you are spiritually alive, and so it is really you who puts your faith in Christ. Okay? And this is where those of us who have a high view of God's sovereignty and salvation sometimes misspeak and almost give the impression, well, the Holy Spirit will have faith for me. No. No. Nobody has faith for you. The Holy Spirit creates faith in you, but it's you (laughs) that must walk by faith, and it's you that must put sin to death. God fills us, he works it in, and we have to work it out. So in the Christian life, we are very much involved. God gets all the glory because he works it in, but we have to work it out. So we contribute absolutely zero to the rebirth, and we are actively involved in our sanctification. So uh, rebirth is the way that God gets us involved in the outworking of our salvation. And so, so both truths of Scripture are preserved. God gets all the glory for salvation. It's not that he did 99% and then you did the last 1% of choosing to believe. No, uh, okay. By grace, through faith, that no one may boast. There's literally zero to boast about. God created that faith in you. And now that it's there, believe in Christ. <laughs> Puts sin to death. Grow. So both truths are preserved. Uh, you'd, have to, you'd have to give him a little more credit. He feeds you peanut butter and jam and sandwiches so he gives you strength and he, yeah. It's, it's all empowered by grace, but it's actually us that are carrying that grace out. There was a hand over here. Amen. And, and normally those things go together. Normally as that fruit of the Spirit is taking life in us, we have more and more to look at and say, clearly this is a work of God's Holy Spirit. Right? Because if left to myself, I would struggle here, 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 and here, and, and look at all the progress I've made. Yeah. Assurance and obedience tend to go very much hand in hand, which is why Christians tend to get pretty miserable when they're sinning. Who's ever met a happy Christian that was living in sin? It's not going to happen. It robs you of your assurance. It robs you of your joy. Okay? If you want to be a happy Christian, walk righteously. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and the human will is, 
yeah, in that sense of what Keith's saying, that we're rooted in Christ. So in none of this does God ever violate our will. He gives us a new will to desire new things. We always, 100% of the time, everyone you have ever met at every point in their life is always doing what they want to do. Zero exceptions. Yep. It disturbed Jesus' listeners too. Many of them walked away. John 6. There's a good track record of people leaving the job site when you start preaching that way. Yeah. But, but yeah, there are no exceptions. Like, literally zero exceptions. People always choose what they want in the moment of decision. Yep, but, but that is Christ being formed in us to give us new desires. And even, even the, the, the conflict that we've seen in Romans 6 that Paul experiences is exactly that. There's two, there's two guys here willing different things. And at the moment of decision, we're always doing what we want. But that's the nature of the war. The old man is slow to die and the new man is slow to be raised up. And we need to... Uh, step back and think about, okay, why are there these warring desires? Think about it. What do I really want? I want glory. I want eternal life. I want joy. I want peace. I want assurance. Well, then sin makes no sense. Right? There was a hand here somewhere in the middle. I think that's Proverbs. Yeah, Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly. Yes. Yeah, Charlie, I think you're exactly right. The old man and the new man. The seductress, the whore, who wants you for something and then she wipes her mouth and says, I've done nothing wrong. Or the wise lady who's there to help make you stronger. Two different women. Well, now's not the week f- that I want to uh, criticize Harrison Butker. For the next several weeks, I will have nothing but positive to say about him. <laughs> and then, once the mob dies down, then we're going to talk about how we're saved. <laughs> and his Roman Catholic view of salvation is terrible, right? Because uh, marriage is a sacrament of the church that's going to help you get more saved. Um, so his Roman Catholicism did show through in that speech he gave. But I'm willing to set that aside for now because he said a lot of righteous things and a lot of biblical things in that speech. So we're not going to, I'm not going to join the mobs jumping on him right now. But in Roman Catholicism, the sacraments are what saves you. And marriage is a sacrament. With the hope of salvation. In Roman Catholicism, you can never know you're saved, ever. You can hope. Right, but there's hope and then there's hope. (laughs) There's hope that knows something and there's hope that's... I hope so. I hope I win the lottery is different than looking forward to a hope that I know is a settled hope and a settled assurance. One is kind of just a random chance. But but yes, in Roman Catholicism, you can honestly never know you're saved. It's a treadmill that never ends until you die and then you find out whether... You're one of the lucky ones that go straight to heaven, whether you're the 99.9999999% that need to go to purgatory, or if you're a heretic, you just go straight to hell, no purgatory. Purgatory is actually good news if you're a Roman Catholic, because it at least means you're on your way to heaven. People in purgatory end up getting emptied out into heaven. So I guess it's good news to say, oh, I've got two million years to burn off my sin here. Um, It's, yeah, it's a hopeless system, which is why we needed the Reformation. Let's keep moving here. So the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. They pursue a heavenly life. 
in gospel obedience to all the commands that Christ as head and king has given them in his word. And so we've got three passages here. Who wants to take Ephesians 4.15? Ron. Who wants to take 2 Corinthians 3.18? Tim? And then lastly, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Maggie. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Very good. We're so used to thinking about Christ as the head that I think it's worth stopping and asking, what does the head do? What's the control center for you as a person? The head. The head makes decisions. The head sends signals to open your hand or close your hand. Okay? Everything else in your body works according to what your head is telling it to do. Christ the head. As we're joined in Christ... The parts, the members, and the Bible uses that language lots, start to work in conformity with what the head desires. Okay? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we submit to the headship of Christ, we see more and more the, the members are acting in accord with what the head wants. So this is healthy language. Again, the hand, if you're a hand, you actually are involved in being that hand, but the signal... The command comes from the head. Okay, so again, Christ is working it in. You work it out. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Who had that? Okay, there again. We're growing from one... One degree of glory to another. So I'm going to ask, does this sound like the trajectory of the Christian life is flat? From glory to glory. Does that sound flat? Or are we actually ascending the mountain of righteousness? What's happening? What's the trajectory here? We're heading for higher ground. ground. Is that a plug? (laughs) Yeah. We're headed for higher ground. New heights I'm gaining every day. Right? Can you see that the trajectory is upward? Can we see that? And even setbacks should be, should be viewed in light of the fact that the trajectory is upward? Can we see that? You guys are very quiet this morning. Maybe it's the new seating arrangement. We'll have to get used to it. Yeah, Don's just saying he he can see it in Scripture, but he doesn't always feel it. And that's probably most of us, I'm guessing. But then do a thought experiment and just close your eyes and think back. If 20-year-old you showed up and stood in front of you, you'd probably get pretty impatient with that guy. Right? I would. Right? And then you can see, okay, so some progress has happened. I have learned a few things, right? Christ has been formed in me. Yeah, Tim, Tim just said it, there's maybe value in writing out our testimony every so many years so you're forced to stop and think about what God has done in your life since the last time you did this. Right? And yeah, yeah, no, very good. I think that would be a great exercise to do that every so often. With, writing out your testimony every so many years. And then you can look back and say, okay, well, if it's six years since I last did it, look at what's happened in these six years. But the problem with us is we always just take the next thing for granted. And so we just shove it away in our pocket and think, well, that's just how life is. It's like, oh, no. God's God's given us a lot in that time. 
Let's go lastly to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Who had that one? Maggie, right? Yeah, go ahead and read that. Okay, very good. So there again, you see the picture. So we have these promises. Whose promises are those? God's. God just did it. Okay, you did not earn those promises. God just did it. Okay, so since that, so because of that, because God did this, therefore let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement. Okay, God works it in, you work it out. That's the pattern. And we'll stop there. It's 10, 16. Any final comments on this before we wrap this chapter up? Who? Oh, go ahead. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken us that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So right there, it's, it's God is going to give you a way of escape, but it comes back to you to the person. Yep. Yeah, it, you're the one in the battle, right? Yep. Yeah, God has given you a full chest of armor. He's given you weapons, but it's it, you who uses them, right? So this is not passive. Yeah, Tim just read, if you didn't hear it in the back, Tim just read uh, 1 Corinthians ten thirteen, that the Holy Spirit enables us to fight, but it's you who must fight the temptation, and you have all the tools to do it. So you can't say in the moment of temptation, you can't say the devil made me do it, okay? And you can't say God made me do it. You did it. You did it. He gave you all the tools to get out of it. You chose that. Okay? But the power to fight sin is absolutely there. And I hope this has been an encouraging chapter for all of us in a very practical way as we work out our sanctification to frame it properly. We are fighting a defeated foe. We do not need to be shrill. We do not need to be desperate. We can be confident. We go out on the battlefield knowing we've already won. Okay? You're stepping on the ice knowing that you've won this game. Your coach promised you, and he's never been wrong. So now you get to actually have fun playing hockey because you're going to win. Right? So it, it's a winner's mindset towards sanctification rather than a loser's mindset. Okay? Oh, I hope I don't screw up. I hope I don't screw up. I hope I don't screw up. Okay? We're fighting as people who already have been assured of victory, and that's how we overcome evil. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, I want to thank you for uh, this group of believers. I want to thank you that your Holy Spirit is living and active. And today on Pentecost especially, I want to uh, thank you and give you honor and give you glory that you did not leave us alone when Christ ascended back to heaven, but you gave us a helper. You gave us your Holy Spirit who can help us to see sin in our lives and who also empowers us to go to work killing that sin and growing in the fruit of your Holy Spirit. Lord, and I pray for each one here, wherever we are at on our journey of sanctification. Lord, I pray that by your Spirit, we would continue to put sin to death. That we can see that when we are walking with the Spirit, that we do indeed move from one degree of glory to the next. And that the trajectory is upward. Lord, I pray for those who are in a season of discouragement, where it feels like sin has been temporarily getting the upper hand. Lord, I pray for those, a special dose of your Spirit, both to walk in obedience and then Uh, also for the enjoyment of assurance that comes as we walk with you. Lord, open our eyes to the treasures of your word. Open our eyes to our own sin. Help us to see ourselves honestly and help us to fight sin out of uh, of what you have done, that it may not be desperate, but rather confident uh, and joyful as we put the old patterns to death in our lives. We thank you for your kindness and pray for a time of fellowship. Pray that that would be edifying. And then I pray that uh, you would be glorified as we move to corporate worship later this morning. Thank you for your goodness. We pray this all in the strong name of Jesus. And amen.